it's, it really is an honor to be here. Uh, and I've had a really stimulating day looking at the exciting projects going on. I was here about 10 years ago at a very early stage of this project when we couldn't get any money for it because when we sent grant proposals in, everybody said, well, if you blow up the sample, you can't possibly get any useful information. And it was really Henry Chapman's paper in 2006 uh, using flash in Germany, which showed that you could get the elastic scattering because it happens instantaneously and necessarily does not deposit energy in the sample before you blow up the sample and therefore get useful elastic scattering. That is to say, you can get information from samples with an XFEL, which avoid all radiation damage pretty much. Uh, if you've got lots of copies of the sample, because you need to keep firing in fresh copies all the time since you're, it's a destructive readout method. So on the strength of that, we put in a proposal uh, for one of these NSF STC science and technology centers in 2011. Ed Latman and I wrote it with others, and uh, by some miracle, it, it was supported. There were, there were 300 applicants, and they funded three of them. Um, and I'll just give a quick review of some of the work going on in that grant proposal. It consists of about uh, a, a dozen universities. Most of them contain a, a single professor supported by a grant of about 200K. Uh, and there are about half of them are biologists, structural biologists, and the other half are methods development people. Here they are, the green people are the biologists, and the red ones are the technique development people. And most of the technique development is done in my university at Arizona State University. We have about six people funded there. The other universities have mostly one. These things usually run for 10 years. They have a budget of 50 million, but it boils down to about a 200K grant per professor. So the first question to ask, because grant ref proposals for beam time at the LCLS will be turned down if the work could be done at a synchrotron, it's important to ask the question, what are the situations in which there is an advantage in using XFEL rather than a, a synchrotron? As I've said, avoiding radiation damage is perhaps the, the most important reason. And you can say that in a simple way, the smallest crystals fry before they give Bragg spots at a synchrotron, but not at the XFEL. Uh, we can get, because we don't have to freeze our samples, we can get we can work at room temperature uh, and avoid radiation damage. So we don't need to freeze to avoid damage. And there have been several papers now looking at the difference between structures done at synchrotrons and XFELs. The side chains mainly differ, and this is thought to be partly due to the freezing, but this is a big topic. I can give a talk for an hour on that alone, I think. Uh, the better time resolution is a mixed blessing. Of course, we can go down. The jitter limits us to about 50 femtoseconds. So you can certainly do pump probe experiments at much shorter time intervals. Whether those are valuable in biology or not is a good question. The times in biology tend to be rather slow. Remember that protein unfolding takes microseconds, not femtoseconds. Um, but something we didn't anticipate and took a while to sink into me is the value of studying irreversible reactions. Because we destroy the sample and bring in a fresh copy, uh, we can look at chemical reactions without having to make the process repeat in a stroboscopic manner that you normally do in, for example, Zewell's work in electron microscopy or Keith Moffat's work here on biocars. What you do there is run a mechanical, a molecular machine through a cycle and take snapshots at the same point of the cycle and add them up. But a lot of processes in nature with proteins are not like that. They're irreversible and we can study them because we keep supplying fresh sample. Um, we're finding more and more, particularly the GPCRs, which I'll talk about, cases where it's very difficult. It takes a long, you can grow big crystals, big enough for a synchrotron, but it takes a long time, and you get showers of nanocrystals very readily, by contrast. There's some subtle technical points. With time-resolved crystallography, as is pioneered here by Keith Moffat and his group, Biocars and others, there's always a problem matching the optical absorption length of the pump laser to the size of the crystal. Since we use nanocrystals, that's not a problem in our way of doing things. And finally, we're making mixing jets. Now, it turns out that because the crystals are small again, the diffusion time 
for, say, an enzyme into a substrate is very short in a, with a nanocrystal, and you can do diffusive mixing. This makes an important experimental advantage. If you think of a droplet of ink in water, it doesn't go anywhere, it just sits there. This is a solution of Fick's law, right? It takes forever to spread out. So there's a problem, and that's solved by using nanocrystals. Now, a very recent trend is we're starting to see higher resolution uh, from protein crystals at the exfil than on the same material, whatever that means, at a synchrotron. And this, is, I think, will increasingly, in, hugely increase the demand. When we think about whether smaller crystals are better, this is an internal problem, it's endlessly discussed, we don't have time to go through it, but I would just ask you to remember four Ds. It depends on at least the following things, which start with D. The diameter of the beam. Now, the beam at the LCLS can be as small as a tenth of a micron. Tenth of a micron. The de Waller factor, of course, and that includes a lot of information about defects. The defects and their type, and their type is very important as to whether having a smaller crystal is beneficial. And finally, the dose. Uh, the main lesson we've learned, of course, is that if you apply the dose quickly, you can apply a much higher dose. You would say this was a failure of reciprocity in radiology, I guess. So if you can apply a higher dose, you get more scattering to high angles and higher resolution. Now, we work in three main modes. We work, for example, with one nanocrystal per shot, and we've called that serial femtosecond crystallography. We can work with one single particle per shot, like a virus. We call that single particle. And finally, we can work with many molecules per shot. That's just sacs, but the particles are frozen in space, are frozen in time, I guess you should say, and they don't rotate during the exposure. So this produces new features in the sacs patterns, makes them two-dimensional. They're not, no longer isotropic, and we call that fast solution scattering. So we've got FSS, SFX and SP, and that will be the three acronyms I'll use throughout this talk, three modes. We're challenged in our goal statement in the STC to develop this serial femtosecond crystallography. So what crystallographers all love, of course, is to see that you can solve structures. So to establish our credibility in the community of structural biology, the first thing we had to do in the first year of the STC is to prove that we can actually solve structures and that they agree with the existing synchrotron structures. So there are now 14 in the literature. These are the 14 high resolution structures uh, that have been published from the LCLS. I don't think there's any from Japan here. The thing I would ask you to look at is the huge reduction in the amount of protein needed since we started. Uh, Henry Chapman and I started on this in 2009. The LCLS first lased in mid-2009 and in my lab, we'd been building the equipment to do these kind of experiments. L let me just say, we concentrate on three areas. Crystal growth, nanocrystal growth, sample delivery, and algorithm development. And we'd been working on that for a few years before 2009. Since then, these structures have been solved, a wide variety of proteins. But the big thing that's happened is that the amount of protein you need has dropped from 300 milligrams here down to half a milligram. And that's very important. OK, let me give my first example here, some work with Vadim Cherezov, who was at Scripps, is now at the University of Southern California, on G-protein coupled receptors, which are a wonderful case uh, where the XFIL has clear advantages. We've now looked at five of these. They're, I think all of them are published now. And, and these are seven transmembrane alpha helix receptors that perform signaling across the cell membrane. They sense molecules outside the cell and activate internal processes. They're very important in humans in things like uh, uh, odors, pheromones, hormones, and neurotransmitters. And some of them are light sensitive, like the rhodopsin in your eye. So the, the proteins bind to receptors that's on the inside of the cell when they receive a signal from outside due to a ligand binding onto the GPCR. There are more than 800 of them in, in uh, human physiology. And I was amazed to find that 22 Nobel Prizes have been awarded for work connected with GPCRs. And of course, the Nobel Prize itself was awarded to Kabilka just a couple of years ago for GPCR work. So here's what I was saying about crystal size. This is for serotonin, which is involved with the sensation of pleasure in your brain. 
is one of the ones we've looked at and published. It's easy to get lots of little hits like this. These little dots are little nanocrystals, which we can fire and spray across the pulsed X-ray beam. Uh, to get this took a year. This hit in a crystal growth trial came almost immediately. So we've saved a year of work by doing things with nanocrystals in a jet rather than large crystals at a synchrotron. And here's the result of our most recent study. It's angiotensin. Now, this is uh, involved in high blood pressure, hypertension. Uh, and again, it's a signaling receptor that spans the membrane of a cell. And, and the aim is to put a drug molecule, a small molecule up here, or here it's embedded here, in such a way that it will suppress the signaling and the angiotensin generator, which is a receptor on the inside of the cell, will no longer rush off and do its job as a vasoconstrictor and shrink your veins and arteries and give you high blood pressure. So what wasn't known was exactly how the small molecule, the drug molecule here, the ligand binds to the receptor running through the cell membrane shown dotted here and here. And here it is shown in more detail. Uh, and as a result of that, what the drug designers can do is go away and uh, modify their small molecule and make it fit better, bind more strongly, and in particular, uh, more selectively, so there are fewer bindings to the wrong site, and that's the thing that gives you side effects. So you want to minimize side effects and give the st strongest possible binding. Um, this, is, this molecule is called AT1R. It's an example of an ARB, uh, another one of which that's on the market now as a prescription drug is Lozatan, and I took one of those pills this morning. So this is a better Lozatan. So, and here we see how it works. It's remarkable. So this is the first GPCR that's been st solved using this serial femtosecond crystallography uh, technique. There are others in the literature, but they were known or we were developing other work. So a total of five of them. Here's three more. Serotonin. <coughs> uh, this is smoothen receptor, which binds to cyclopamine. Cyclopamine occurs in weeds, and when a uh, female sheep eat this weed, they give birth to lambs which have one eye, hence the name cyclopamine, and that's eventually fatal. But it, there are other applications of that, and uh, Uwe Weierstahl led the paper which solved that structure. And then there's another one here, and most recently um, we've had the opiate receptor. The aim here is to make a better painkiller, analgesic, hopefully one which is less addictive than morphine. And here's human rhodopsin is a latest work that isn't published yet. That's the, uh, the, the protein in your eye which, by which you detect light. So let me go on now and talk about the data analysis because in my lab that's a big part of our work is developing better algorithms. You can't just use the standard algorithms like CCP4 to analyze SFX data. There's some unique issues in the data. And I wanted you to see our sort of Monte Carlo method. What's shown here are the multiple measures, measurements of individual Bragg reflections as a function of scattering angle, right? So we're spraying these nanocrystals across the pulsed beam. Uh, we get 120 diffraction patterns a second. If you read out, you work all night, six hours, uh, three nights in a row, 12 hours a night, you get terabytes of data uh, and then merge them all, indexing the Bragg spots from the little nanocrystals and simply averaging those intensities, the multiple measurements of the same spot. But you see the challenge here because in this Monte Carlo method, if I look at one Bragg reflection, it runs from here to here in the multiple uh, samplings of it that we've had from different crystals, all different size, and different, slightly different orientations. And you see that the intensity spans several orders of magnitude. And you, know, you expect you want a small error when you average all that stuff, so that's a challenge. The program which does this is called Christfell, and we developed it with Tom White at DAISY. And there are now several other groups working on this. Um, and I'll say something about how we can improve on the data analysis in a moment. But if these errors are Poisson, due to shot-to-shot -shot variation intensity of the beam, which is perhaps 20%, due to the fact that, let me define a quantity here, I'll call partiality the extent by which we miss 
the exact Bragg condition by chance in a particular shot, or, or at least what, in its original sense due to Rossman, what fraction of the whole Bragg reflection we measure. So the crystals are tumbling across. They have to be wet. In biology, everything has to be wet. And you take a snapshot in the 50 femtosecond pulse of this nanocrystal in a random orientation. So if they're Poisson and you add all the er errors, stochastic effects together, uh, the results should improve, the signal noise should improve as one on the square root of the number of diffraction patterns. So here's the number of diffraction patterns down the bottom, and here is our split, which is a technical thing crystallographers use to measure the error in the data, the variance between odd and even frames. And you see the experiment, which is the black boxes, fits beautifully to one on root n curve. Now, the challenge is to make this prefactor k small. And um, group, several groups around the world are now working on this. Uh, Kapsch, for example, in Heidelberg has produced a program that will uh, help with this problem. And of course, we work with Nick Sauter. So the STC has established an annual data analysis workshop. The next one's going to be part of the ACA workshop in Philadelphia this year. We're going to have these every summer. Nadia Zetsepsen is organizing them. And the first one was last summer in Berkeley, working with Nick Sauter. He's developed his own program. And the aim of all this is to reduce the value of K. So I said before that the amount of protein we need has been hugely reduced. That's very significant. We now, there's a recent work from Helen Jin and the groups in England, Dave Stewart, the head of biology at Diamond, um, in which they got a 1.4 angstrom structure with just 6,000 shots. Now, if you can do this with 6,000 shots instead of the hundreds of thousands we started with, you can think about doing a multi-parameter optimization on every shot. And that's really the state of the art in this field as far as data analysis goes. You, the, but the question is, what should be the target function? What's the optimum thing to optimize? Um, and, and the student, very bright student from Oxford called Helen Jin had a very good idea. Because she came from the gaming industry, she'd worked on Apple uh, apps for Apple, and had no knowledge of crystallography. She came at it fresh, and her idea was that you should often optimize the number of Bragg spots predicted and compare that with the experiment while adjusting experimental parameters. And there are lots of experimental parameters. A critical one is the energy spread in the beam, which is not well characterized, plus the metrology on the detector. Very small tilts make a huge difference, and there are lots of parameters that have to be adjusted. So all this is effort is aimed towards uh, better, faster data analysis. But a beautiful picture was shown by the Sauter's group, which really allows us to understand the data analysis in detail. Here are three bag spots. Now, the very smallest crystals give us interference effects, I'm sure you've seen, between the bag spots. At the other extreme, the very big crystals have this mosaic block structure, we suppose, due to proposed by Ewald 100 years ago. Um, and in that case, each little block each tilted block is acting as a monochromator. It's picking out one wavelength from the range in the beam and sending them off into some direction. The result is that each spot becomes a little arc, and the span of the arc increases as you go to higher resolution. This is increasing scattering angle this way. So you need to model the angular profile of the Bragg spot. Uh, Michael Rossman called this the American method, which is to say you shoot first, ask questions later. So basically what's happening here is Instead of using a goniometer to set up a crystal in a particular orientation and then rocking it through the Bragg condition, we just fire crystal lights across the beam uh, 120 a second uh, and collect the data and then figure out the crystallography later with smart software. So just to confirm that, here's this example that's just appeared in, in Nature Knitting or Nature Nature No Mission, I think, <laughs> one of those. So uh, they used, in 30 minutes at their LCLS, they got 6,000 diffraction patterns and a 1.7 angstrom structure. This is just showing the reduction in the amount of data needed to solve structures. So in half an hour, you can now get a structure. OK, let's move on to some other things. Um, in the general theme of how to develop this SFX method, serial femtosecond crystallography, shoot first, ask questions later, spray nanocrystals across the beam. We'd very much like to track the oxidation state of the heavy atoms in the proteins, and so we'd like to develop simultaneous spectroscopy with our snapshots. 
And that's already been done by the Berkeley Group, Kern and Co., and they saw some interesting effects on uh, oxidation and reduction of the heavy atoms. We normally think that our uh, heavy atoms in protein crystallography, as you see them in the density map, have too many electrons. Uh, and this suggests that if you do it in XFL, they don't, uh, which is interesting. It needs further looking into. But certainly, uh, there are chemical shifts on the positions of the manganese edge in photosystem two, which is responsible for photosynthesis. It goes around this so-called Cox cycle. And by detecting and carefully measuring the peak position, you can tell the oxidation state of the manganese. It will be wonderful to have that in correlation with the time-resolved density map. So you'd have a molecular movie of the core uh, protein and manganese, multivalent manganese, responsible for photosynthesis. So we're developing that, and these are the people involved, and it's starting to work. What I think will be the way to go is, of course, absorption spectroscopy rather than emission spectroscopy, which is much more difficult, but can be done with an XFEL. Certainly, you can do it within the range of energies in the beam, and people are doing it over a wider range now for the first time. Let me say something about sample delivery. Um, and this is an old story you've probably heard before. This was done in my lab with Uwe Weierstahl. Uh, we tried to get all this stuff running at the ALS around 2007, and the jets we're making kept clogging. The solution to that is to have a gas-focused jet, shown here. We have high-pressure helium coming out here, this is the liquid carrying the protein nanocrystals or the viruses or whatever it is you want to study. Now, the gas comes out at high pressure and speeds up the liquid. Because, if you remember Bernoulli's theorem and all that stuff, area times velocity is a constant. So if we speed up a liquid, this is happening in the air conditioning system here, if we speed up a liquid, it gets thinner. And that's the main trick here. The air here has sped up this liquid, which has thinned it out. So you have focusing. So down here come the nanocrystals, and we can then have a large inner jet nozzle diameter here, which doesn't clog because it's big, but a liquid stream much finer. And the finest stream we've got here is about a half a micron, a third of a micron. It's a bit, this is a uh, long exposure, you can't see it, but these are actual individual droplets down here. The smallest droplets we've got are about a third of a micron. It's a bit like an inkjet printer except that they are 40 micron droplets, and these are, can be down to half a micron. Now, we have a very skilled technician uh, from Russia, a young woman who's terrific at this, and she made this one. And we need to make this for everyone who uses, who does structural biology at the LCLS, and we've been doing that for the last uh, several years. But we really need a reproducible method to do it, and so we're working with 3D printing but this is no ordinary 3D printing. It's a two-photon polymerization process by which you can get down to about micron re resolution. These machines cost about half a million dollars, and I'm just going to keep sending in grant proposals for this thing until we get it. Uh, and here are our first results. So we're working with the company in Germany to make 3D printed nozzles, which consist of a tube within a tube, as you saw. So it's a complicated 3D structure. The, I remember coming here to your nanofab and asking how to build this thing about three years ago. Incidentally, I should have said, I've given a talk here about 10 years ago, which was on the, the preliminary work that went behind all of this. At that time, we were trying to align the molecules with a laser. But the semiconductor industry abhors uh, cylindrical geometry. Of course, the planar geometry was a great breakthrough of Fairchild. But, so the, just I visited all the national labs and asked them how could we make these things, and no one seemed to see how it could be done. So we've settled on 3D printing, and here are our first results. This is one that's been made on its substrate by the 3D printing process, two photon polymerization with micron resolution by the company in Germany, and they send them to us. And for the first time a couple of weeks ago, we got one working. So this is fully assembled. We assemble them in our lab, with epoxy and so forth, and you see the jet here. It's not straight. Uh, that's a bit of a problem. Glass is about the smoothest thing you can get uh, outside of the semiconductor industry, I think. So the handmade ones are very good. And the 3D printed one are going to have a surface roughness on the order of a micron, and that, that could well be a problem. The other thing is the costs. Look, we're, because we're working with the company, because we're working with the company, they give us them free. But they say that from now on they're going to charge us. 
it, we've been designing them and helping them design them. It's a collaboration. And they'll want $1,000 each. And it takes four hours to make one. So the machine goes whir, whir, click, click for four hours and spits out this thing that's so small you can't see it. Um, if Stella, our technician, makes them, it takes her four hours and they're free. And I think they have a smoother surface finish. But on the other hand, with this printing process, we can make a huge variety of reproducible nozzles. And I'll talk later about sheet jets for solution scattering and mixing jets. So you've probably seen this picture from 2011 from our beam time in 2009 uh, with Henry Chapman and Petra Fromm. We got these fringes between the Bragg spots. And if you remember what diffraction from a grating of N slits looks like, you have N minus two subsidiary minima between the major Bragg spot peaks, uh, which is to say by counting these fringes, I can tell how many unit cells there are in this little nanocrystal. And I think there's 19 periods along G in this crystal. So this would might be a 20 by 20 by 20 unit cell crystal. This is a streak from the, our liquid jet. But again, along this theme of developing serial femtosome crystallography, I wanted to say that this method of solving the phase problem using that kind of data has now been demonstrated experimentally. Rick Kirian led the effort at uh, using the, the, the X-ray laser in Italy, Fermi, and it's just been published in this new journal, PhysRev X. So he made artificial crystals and put this very soft X-ray uh, radiation, coherent radiation on it, got these diffraction patterns, and reconstructed these images of the unit cell. But the image, there's four of them, and the point here is that if you have a protein crystal, a very small one, nature doesn't care where it terminates the crystal. You know, if you've got two molecules per unit cell, it can have two and a half unit cells across one side and ten and a half on a different side. So there are different terminations possible, and a set of those can be defined by the choice of unit cell. So here are the four structures that they made by lithography. Uh, in the interior, they're all the same, the same crystal, but they terminate differently. Now, when you change the termination, in this case described by choice of unit cell, the fringes between the Bragg spots change completely. So you might wonder what you reconstruct. Well, uh, I published a, proposed a way to solve this with a paper a few years ago, and this shows that it works, and that you c can indeed just reconstruct the different choice of, unique un choice of unit cell, which is defined by the termination of the crystal. Now this works in practice. Here's lysozyme, just a real data from uh, slices taken out of the sections out of the 3D diffraction volume showing that we do indeed get these streaks between the spots on different symmetry planes from the diffraction data. So that's all I'll say about development of serial femtosecond crystallography and the sort of new research we've been doing, the, the, the ways in which we're trying to advance it, mainly by work at ASU. The second topic I want to talk about is time-resolved work with serial femtosecond crystallography. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's done as follows. At the moment, we hope to improve on this. Uh, here's our X-ray beam. Here are our little nanocrystals running across in this liquid stream I showed you coming out of that gas-focused jet. And of course, as you do here at Biocars, we illuminate with a pump laser the crystallites here. There's a delay, and then you take their X-ray snapshot. And it's shown in more detail down here. This is called a gas dynamic virtual nozzle. It's, it's the tube within the uh, fiber optic inside the capillary tube here, supplying the sample. And here's our pump laser arrangements here. So typically, the delays here, as I said, were microseconds. And this is all work on photosynthesis originating in Petra Fromm's lab at ASU. She's an authority on photosynthesis, a wonderful problem because it has everything from a funding point of view. You can get money from all three agencies. Uh, it, it deals, it, it digests CO2, is relevant to global warming, and of course it maintains life on Earth uh, through the splitting of water. So the molecular machine is very important to understand exactly how that molecular machine works. And here it is running. I've shown you this before, I'm sure, but this is ice, so you can ignore that. The flashing is the X-ray beam, the LCLS, blowing up the little crystals, 120 a second. This bright spot is the pump laser, which is illuminating them, 
exactly as sunlight falls on a leaf. So this is simulating sunlight, on, but except that they're nanocrystals of the molecule that does the photosynthesis. And here's the ice. So how does that work? Now, I'm going to give you an example in some work that uh, came out of uh, Mario Schmidt's group. It's not photosynthesis, but it's a photosensitive bacteria called photoactive yellow protein. Now, I need to start the movie again because we're going around this cycle and the colours here correspond to the colours in the species indicated, in the labels of the species indicated over here. So we're up to purple now. This purple here is the amount of this chemical species produced after a certain pump probe delay. And as time goes by, the purple should change to red. It has. And so the red colour here, that structure in red, corresponds to this species. These are the time delays between the occurrence of these species uh, and the, the, this, the concentration of them falls off exponentially. These times, they're not electronic lifetimes, excited state lifetimes at all. This is biology. So these are the inverse of chemical reaction rate constants. They're, they're related, if you think, to the amount of species present after a time due to this chemical reaction, which is triggered by the light. So the light is the ligand in some sense. So we're up to blue now. That comes around to here. And we get back to the start. This is the start of the cycle in the dark before the pump light arrives. Now, it's important to see here that this is a very well-studied system, but there are two chemical reactions. So for people who are not into biology or proteins, or you need to know the following. Unlike material science, where our crystals are more or less continually bonded networks, in protein crystallography, each unit cell is like a bathtub with a baby in it. It's mostly water, and the molecule in each unit cell barely communicates with the one in the next cell. So the chemical reaction is occurring deep inside the molecule, in each separate molecule. And in this case, there are two reaction paths. So some of the molecules are following this path, some are following this path, and some are not reacting at all. But we have to have what I'll call a Bragg boost. You have to have that coherent amplification of intensity to get atomic resolution. This is a general problem in imaging with x-rays. If you can make a crystal, even if it's only 10 by 10 by 10, you get a million times more intensity because the scattering in one of those pixels within the angular profile of the Bragg peak goes as the square of the number of atoms or the number of electrons in the sample. So if we've got 10 by 10 by 10 nanocrystal, 10 cubed is 1,000, the square of that is a million. You don't have to build an exfil a million times more powerful to see atoms. Saves a lot of money. This is why crystallography is so powerful. Of course, it's very difficult to make 10 by 10 crystals, and you have to have multiple copies for this technique because you're destroying them as you look at them. But the scattering from a dielectric sphere with x-rays falls off as theta to the minus 4. So looking at a single particle is very, very difficult. You're a million times down on scattering by comparison with a 10 by 10 by 10 nanocrystal of those spheres. So let's keep going. This shows the amounts of those species. By analyzing that density map, the real space density map obtained by Bragg spot analysis, um, singular value decomposition, some certain amount of molecular dynamics, modeling, you can work out how much of each species is present as a function of time. So here are those separate uh, species that I showed in the time-dependent map, PR2, PB1, rising and falling with time after the flash of light has initiated the reaction. Now, for Bob Wondriel, and uh, I brought here the statistics. This is what crystallographers love to look at, and people who hate crystallography don't. And I, you'll see here crucial numbers, uh, like R split for the, this, this quality of the data is indicated. But look here, that's uh, an interesting number, I think, is probably the... Um, the number of times that we measure each Bragg reflection as the crystallites fly across the beam. 46,000 samples of, uh, were taken here. The num this is the number of spots indexed. The fr we had f half a million frames in this case, uh, of which 75,000 uh, were good diffraction patterns, and we could index about half of them with auto-indexing. So you need at least 10 or 20 spots to be able to index the pattern. Uh, redundancy is an interesting number. That's how many t 
times you measured a particular given Bragg reflection, 2,000. So lots of samples of the particular Bragg reflection. Okay. My theme is how to develop time-resolved imaging with an XFEL. And I've given an example of our latest work using little crystals. Because of this Bragg boost being absent for single particle imaging, we have one virus per shot. I think it's pretty hopeless to do high-resolution, time-resolved work on things from which you cannot form a crystal, like a virus. But it's as well to be aware of the following. This summer in Germany, they're holding a conference on how to make an attosecond laser, X-ray laser, and it looks like the Germans are going to build one of these things if they can get the money. Now, let's look at what happens to time-resolved work with attosecond laser pulses. This is the band limit theorem, or if you multiply by h bar, the time and energy uncertainty principle. It says that to make a very short pulse, you need a spread in energy four of equal to about 4 over the energy in EV. If I go down to something like 14 attoseconds, which is not unthinkable, this spread in energy comes out to be 300 EV at 10 kV. Now, 300 EV is a 3% bandwidth, and that's just about useful enough to do the kind of work that Keith Moffat and the Biocars people do here, because it allows you to use the Lowy mode. Now, the Lowy mode just means that the spread of wavelengths in the beam is sufficiently large that you span that rocking curve, that angular profile, the angular width of the Bragg spot, and therefore you only need one shot. You get a structure factor from one measurement. The structure factor is the angle integrated Bragg spot intensity. And the problem is how to perform that angular integration when in a single shot, at the LCLS anyway, we just take a very fine slice of that angular profile. We want the whole area under the curve. Well, you'll get it with very brief, even briefer pulses from the bandwidth expression here. The Lowy mode means you have a wide range of energies in the beam, and so you, the Bragg condition is satisfied for far more reflections, but it also spans the angular width of the spot and gives you your Fourier coefficients of the charge density in one shot. That's what you need for time-resolved imaging. But I said before that the biologists really are interested in much longer times. You know, the time for proteins to unfold is microseconds, if not longer. And, and, and when, if you're unlucky enough to get AIDS, the virus takes a full second to inject the genome into your cells. So femtoseconds are of no interest to biologists. Uh, what they want to see are chemical reactions. So we've made this mixing jet in my lab. It's like a telescope. Uh, and we have this, again, the focusing gas on the outside to speed up and narrow the jet. This is an image of an experimental image with a high-speed camera of this necking instability where the jet breaks up into droplets. The theory for that was given by Rayleigh around 1890. Jack Strutt was his full name, and uh, he gave the theory for this, this necking instability. So we have the gas out here, and then we have two inner tubes, A and B, or spaces. In the interstitial space between those tubes, we put our substrate, one of the chemicals we want to react, and the, and the inner one, we put, for example, an enzyme. That's a catalyst. Now, they'll mix at this point, and they'll mix rapidly because the particles are small, if they're nanocrystals, because we have the benefit that the diffusion time is short for very small crystals. And the, the reaction can't start. You can't start the clock on the reaction until everything's thoroughly mixed up together. So the time resolution of this gadget is equal to the mixing time. Now, I've put over here... That time is 17, uh, the t diffusion time into nanocrystals is 17 microseconds for glucose in a half micron crystal. Very fast, relatively. The mixing time here turns out to be about 200 microseconds, and that's the time res resolution of the gadget. Now, in this space, having mixed, they then react chemically. They emerge here, and you take their snapshot. If you want to look at a different time delay between when they mix and uh, a different reaction time, you just slide this blue tube glass tube back to, to allow a further, longer distance here. And by that way, we collect lots of data for one reaction time and then pull this back, collect a lot more data. We should get a time series. For each time step, of course, we'll reconstruct the three-dimensional density map, and we hope, as a result, we'll be able to get a 3D molecular movie, a movie of molecular machines at work. 
So that's we're trying that out soon. We measured the time resolution by putting in a die in the inner tube and a quencher in the outer one. And then you can see, if there's no quencher, the inner solution runs along right along here. It's a fluorescent dye. If I put the quencher in here, it dies out. The, the luminescence dies out by about here. And by measuring that distance and knowing the speed, you can figure out the time resolution of the gadget. Alexander Ross at ASU, professor in chemistry, has been developing electrophoresis and microfluidics to integrate with the sample delivery. So this is her gadget running. She puts voltages across solutions and runs uh, nanocrystals in here. And what results is a size sorter. So this gadget will allow the largest nanocrystals to go straight ahead and the smaller ones are deflected off to the side. And we have others with multiple outlets. And uh, we've actually tested this at the LCLS. Just plug the output into that jet that I showed and you can look at uh, crystals of a particular size. And in the paper, it discusses the effect of size selection on the refinement, uh, on the data analysis, and whether you get more accurate structure factors quick, more, more rapidly. We do waste a lot of, this is the water jet running at the present, and that's the spot. It's roughly to scale. And you see all the nanocrystals, this flashes from the X-ray laser 120 a second. All the protein between shots runs to waste. And that's completely unacceptable. We think we have a solution to that. Because here down here, I show a modification to the jet where it's pulsed. And you see it's pulsing on and off. Just to establish that using a piezo, we can switch our jet on and off and switch it off between x-ray shots in order to save protein. And the amount of protein we need is hugely reduced. But there's a very elegant way to do this, which Alex Ross's lab uh, devised. This is working now. You know, if you mix oil and vinegar, the oil balls up into little droplets because of surface tension. And so it is that if you inject oil from the sides into a mixture of buffer and protein coming down here, uh, in fact, it's the buffer which balls up into droplets, and they enter into this tube here and form slugs, which alternate. So you get a slug of oil and a slug of protein in its buffer. And if we time this by adjusting the pressure up here to the right velocity, uh, then we can arrange so that there's no protein between x-ray shots. In that way, we, this, this thing works beautifully. And what I love about it is there's no buzzers, you know, it just, just runs smoothly, continuously all the time. And that's described in a paper from this Puerto Rico conference we had in January. Another way we're trying to advance serial femtosecond crystallography is to image viruses and solve virus structures. And these can be formed into crystals with some difficulty, even being so large, for icosahedral viruses. But there's a class which is particularly difficult to crystallize, and they're called enveloping viruses. And, and uh, Brenda Hogue at ASU is an expert in them. And we got our first patents from an enveloping virus. There are very few such diffraction patterns in the literature here. Uh, it extends only to 37 angstroms. But what's interesting is all the diffuse scattering between the Bragg spots, and particularly that it's structured. And so we're thinking now about how, what that means. Uh, the icosahedra, you know, oriented differently in each unit cell. Is the genome inside uh, packed differently? Any kind of disorder. But it has to give you structured diffuse, not isotropic diffuse. So they're in the midst of figuring all that out at the moment. Now, I said we work in three modes. Another mode was single particle imaging with one particle per shot. And Janus Hoidu's group has just led this paper with Rick Kirian from ASU, where the point of it was to get snapshots of cells, whole cells, while they're still alive. You see, you can argue that these cells coming in in the water jet, they're alive. And because then they're zapped by the X-ray beam. Well, first we collect the elastic scattering who knows if they're still alive when that happens, but then they're destroyed. So this is a method of snapshot imaging of living things. And here they are, cells in the process of division. They're, they've been treated so they're just about to divide when they enter the jet. Uh, so here are the diffraction patterns from lots of these viruses. I'm sorry, cells. Here are the reconstructed images using the algorithms, hybrid input out algorithm, phenop algorithm, and so forth, or Fidelsa's algorithm, perhaps, Hawk. Uh, shown here, and here's uh, what you can do is compute various forms of phase contrast image from that. 
The problem with making 3D images of cells, of course, is that all cells are different. So you can't merge the data and get a 3D picture. The best, what's the best that's been done with single particles? Well, certainly let me start off by saying it's much worse than you can do with cryo-EM, which is now at about three angstrom resolution because of their new detectors. But the best we've done in collaboration with Ilmer Schlichting from Heidelberg is this picture where it's an icosahedral virus and in this single shot where the LCLS beam was dead on, it was a direct hit, zero impact parameter, from chlorella virus, uh, we get about 120 angstrom resolution. So that's the state of the art. And the LCLS has a program now called the Single Particle Initiative where they've called people to come from all around the world and help them clean up the beam line. Because if you ask why, what limits the resolution, if you add enough of these together, remembering my one on root n thing, you should be able to get any resolution you like, even though the intensity is falling off as theta to the minus four. Uh, it's a law of diminishing returns, but you wouldn't need too many patterns like this if there was no background before you could get out to, say, 10 angstrom resolution. That would be wonderful. So my students and other students from all around the place, Sweden and Germany and everywhere in the US, uh, are crawling around out of the chambers at the, late at night in special non-competitive beam time using special scientifically uh, unimportant samples so that these big cheese uh, biologists will collaborate with each other because they know they cannot get this on the cover of nature because it's some boring um, empty capsid thingy that no one cares about. But it will be used, maybe this is going to run for two years, just to debug and systematically track down all the sources of error on the beam line uh, that are giving us the background, preventing or limiting the resolution in the single particle mode. Rick Kerrion at ASU has made a better sample delivery gadget. He can now get a five micron focus in a stream of single particles with his fancy um, gas delivery dice, and he's had an even better idea, which is to run the viruses down the center of a hollow tube of light. Now, in this, it's called a Bessel beam. In this picture, movie, we're just showing that the particles are trapped. It's a bit like laser tweezers. Uh, that green is the laser beam, which is a donut, because you're looking along the beam, and you see how the particles moved when we moved the beam. So this is as far as we've got, that the particles are in fact trapped inside the beam. So this is the optics you need to generate these hollow Bessel beams along which you can trap particles. Okay, next topic is fast solution scattering. And this particular interest in mine, I started, I got interested in this when I was at LBL around 2005 with Malcolm Howells. Malcolm really, really resurrected, I think I was credit for resurgence of interest in uh, Zvi Cam's theory. Uh, and so we wanted a better way to do essentially SACs, but under the special condition that the particles do not rotate during the exposure. And that makes the patterns two-dimensional and isotropic instead of the normal isotropic SAC patterns. So we thought we'd make a sheet jet. Uh, if you mix two streams this way, they form a sheet and you could have your proteins here and your LCLS beam here, drilling holes in this thin film of liquid, which will heal, and you take another shot. And here's a recent experimental image uh, of a sheet jet. Now, with our 3D printer, you see, we can make any shape we like up here. It's got to be focused by the outer gas, so it's a complicated structure. But if we have a slot, we'll get a sheet jet like this with a thick rim. Here it is looking at it from the side. Uh, and we, the theory for that, incidentally, was all worked out by the very famous uh, as, um, fluid dynamicist G.I. Taylor in England in the late 50s. Now, I want to say something about this single particle initiative program because one of the aims is to track down mechanical instabilities so that every X-ray pulse hits a particle. That's fantastically difficult. Just think about it. The viruses are about tenths of a micron in size. Everything on planet Earth is vibrating by, let's say, a micron, including the chamber. And the chamber's got the sample delivery thing on it that I just showed. So that'll give you a one micron wobble if you do nothing at all. Now the X-ray beam we have to consider, and you don't know, the point at which it's lasing is probably jiggling around laterally. So the best measurements that have been done suggest that the focus of the LCLS beam is wandering, fluctuating sideways by about 10 times its diameter. 
Now, our liquid jet can be as small as half a micron, and the X-ray beam is either a couple of microns on one chamber or a tenth of a micron on another, but it's wobbling around all over the place. So these are the stability problems that electron microscopists have dealt with for decades. Uh, I want to make a simple point here. You'll all know that if I double the size of my X-ray beam in sacs on a thin film containing particles, the amount of scattering from those particles does not change. Because when you double the size of the beam, the number of photons in the beam stays the same. So the number of photons per particle is halved, but there's twice as many particles. So the amount of scattering doesn't depend on the size of the beam. Now, in that case, it doesn't matter where the beam hits the liquid. If this is vibrating by micron, you're always going to span a good number of particles in this fast sax mode. And so these vibrational issues go away. You don't need to spend millions of dollars and bring people from all around the world to solve the mechanical instability problem because in fast sax, the scattering signal is independent of the size of the beam and it's any of its vibrations. We're taking femtosecond snapshots. There's another good theorem you can show. If I take that same beam and focus it now down to the size of one particle, but have vibration, so it's hitting randomly all over the place with the same vibration we had before. So this is the same beam with the same number of photons per shot, now focused down to the size of one particle, but hitting randomly in position. It's easy to show using cross-sections that the total scattering is the same. So you don't win by having a focused beam by comparison with a spread out beam if your focused beam is hitting randomly all over the place over the same area that the previous that the beam was spread out for comparison. Yeah. However, if every hit is head on, you can if you aim if you can aim from you know this two mile in this two mile long tunnel uh, and hit each virus uh, with 100% accuracy, 100% hit rate, uh, then of course you win enormously because there's much less background and you get far more signal per unit time than you do by either spreading it out or having a jittering, very fine beam. Uh, and Delano Salden's work I should have talked about here, he's pointed out that if you do a pump probe difference experiment, it's very powerful here because you're taking differences between the same thing, bright and dark, and so most of the errors go away. Unlike our serial crystallography where, you know, we illuminate one crystal, take its diffraction pattern and blow it up, then the next crystal we don't illuminate because we want the difference between the bright illuminated and non-illuminated, but the next crystal is a different size. So you have to do an awful lot of averaging in a Monte Carlo fashion to get high accuracy. I think I'll skip over this, uh, or just very quickly say that in my group we've been very interested in using the method of angular correlation functions originally proposed by Sv. Cam in 1981. It's based on the following idea. Here's a virus. There is a thing called the angular correlation function you can extract from a Sachs pattern. It's basically the convolution of the intensity around a ring, like an autocorrelation function, like a Patterson function in the angular domain. It has the following property. The angular correlation function of that is the same as that. That is to say, it's independent of the particle's orientation. That means that if you take lots of shots of single particles, form their angular correlation functions, you can add them together because they're all the same, and you just get better signal to noise. When you do that, you lose the phase information, but you can get that back by the modern iterative phasing methods, and so you can reconstruct the image of one of them. It's better than that. If there are many particles per shot, you can show that what you get when you form the angular correlation function is the angular correlation of one particle, one orient erect oriented particle, plus a conventional Sachs background. Now, the conventional Sachs background is isotropic, whereas the angular correlation function is not. So it's easy to subtract. And then you have the angular correlation function from one particle. That is to say, you've disentangled the orientational disorder. This is enormously powerful, and I'm sure has relevance to many other fields of physics. So it's a way to unscramble orientational disorder, to, a way to use scattering from many identical particles in random orientations and reconstruct a picture of one typical particle. Now, this has been done experimentally 
by Dmitry Starodub, who was my postdoc. And I think this is a wonderful piece of work. Uh, this, he was able to find a company that sell plastic balls stuck together in dumbbells, in pairs. Obviously, there's nothing, you can't work with balls alone because there's no orientation problem. So this has two orientational degrees of freedom, two order angles needed to define it. This is the reconstructed image. This is LCLS, real experimental data. These are the experimental patterns, typical experimental patterns. Here's his model calculation. And taking lots of shots from these plastic dumbbells in solution, he's reconstructed an image of a typical dumbbell shown here. The resolution is terrible. It's uh, 10, 100 angstroms. But I think it's a promising start because the refractive index of these plastic dumbbells relative to water is not so different from that of protein. And the earlier experiments on angular correlation methods, which is given all kinds of stupid fancy names now, like fluctuation, coherence, to fluctuation, uh, correlation, fluctuation, scattering, something or other, which is transformative and compelling. <laughs> right. That earlier work, um, oh, I forgot, speckle, speckle. <laughs> that earlier work um, was done on much heavier materials. You can do it on metal alloys, and of course it works. But the problem with proteins is just that their refractive index for x-rays is so similar to water that it's a very weak scattering effect. And I think this is a pretty good start. So we're now talking about solution scattering and what opportunities there are for new kinds of solution scattering with an x-ray laser. And I suppose the most spectacular success has been this work where we collaborated with Richard Neutz's group, who led the work. This was in science last year. I'm oh, sorry, Nature Methods last year. So this is time-resolved SACs. Now, in this case, we're not using the CAM method. This is absolutely conventional SACs analysis. And what I'm showing here is the diff it's, the material is called reaction center, RC. And again, it's involved in photosynthesis. It's sensitive to light. It's a protein, shown here, which changes its shape when you shine light on it. And what's shown here is the difference between the scattering in solution from the protein, reaction center, when it's in the dark, and when you shine light on it, by that scheme I showed earlier. Now, what is remarkable, is it's shown, the difference is shown as a function of scattering angle or resolution. What is remarkable is that the difference persists out to about, in fact, I think four angstroms would be a conservative statement here. And secondly, that the time intervals, the time steps, are much finer than is possible on a synchrotron. They go from 280 picoseconds down to half a picosecond. So this is 500 femtoseconds. So I think this is probably a world record for spatial and time resolution, in the bio, certainly in the biology world. Uh, and for each of these differences, we can, of course, make a density map because the structure of this thing is extremely well known from previous crystallography. So this project, I think Richard was very smart in choosing the system here. It was very successful, I've sub subsequently realized, for two reasons. First, he was dealing with a known structure, which had been solved to perhaps one angstrom by crystallography. Second, it's unusual in that this stuff you can get in incredibly high concentration, 100 mg per mil. So you get bags of signal. Um, and you should also know that, of course, there's a lot of molecular dynamics and modeling involved here. Um, and so the, res the result of that is this structure over here where the orange spheres are carbon atoms which move. And he has stereo and molecular movies of this and so forth. Um, so this is work that's not possible on a synchrotron because it's too fast. And it answered two important questions which arose out of Glam Graham Fleming's work in Berkeley uh, as to whether there are fast nuclear motions involved in photosynthesis and how it is that sunlight, which is a cut to about two and a half EV, doesn't unfold the protein in the leaf making, doing photosynthesis. I mean, two and a half electron volts is plenty of energy to unfold a protein, and somehow they survive. And it's an amazing thing Graham told me that they actually repair themselves every half hour. This is a result of evolution. The, the photosynthesis macromolecules get damaged by sunlight. They get, they get sunburn and they fix themselves up. Um, so that's probably our most successful project, I guess. So let me finish up just saying something about uh, the viscous jets. 
that I mentioned before. Uh, it's really a grease gun. We got so many users who had told us that the, they needed too much protein. They couldn't use, the, couldn't use the LCLS because they couldn't get beam time and because you need too much buckets of protein. So Uwe Weierstahl invented this gadget uh, at ASU. It's a pressure amplifier. And uh, I'd met Martin Caffrey at a conference in Ireland in about 2010. And of course, he's a guru on growing membrane proteins. And we got talking, and together with Uwe, came up with this. Uh, Martin pointed out that you can grow lots of membrane proteins in this lipid cubic phase, which was a hot topic at that time. Lipid cubic phase is a goo. It feels like car grease. I mean, it's extremely viscous, like car grease. We call this a toothpaste jet. To force that car grease out the end here, you need high pressure, and this is a pressure amplifier. Normal hydraulics amplifies force. This amplifies pressure. A big piston directly connect to a small piston. Here's the protein in here, in this viscous uh, LCP phase. And the whole point of making a toothpaste jet was to slow down the jet, so you don't need so much protein. Because we were wasting, as I showed in that movie, we were wasting all the protein that runs through between the X-ray shots. So now we have a jet by, by choice of viscosity, which delivers the proteins at about the same rate that the X-ray pulses are coming along. And the hit rate's high, and most importantly, that same medium can be used to grow the microcrystals. You grow them by connecting two syringes together one with LCP and one with the protein in it and shuffling it backwards and forwards for a while by hand. And Martin has a movie on the web to show you how to do it. And growing pro crystals of membrane proteins has been a, a very challenging bottleneck in the whole of structural biology. So that's a big step forward and it's been used to solve all these proteins listed here uh, at the LCLS. Here's a movie of the thing working. Uh, that's the piston just moving up and down there. And we've been more or less giving these things away Here's a movie of it working. The, the, the LCLS beam is running this way across the screen, and it's just drilling holes in this toothpaste. So each of those lines is the uh, X-ray beam drilling a hole. The LCLS drills a hole in stainless steel, three or four stainless steel. If you focus the beam down on a sheet of three or four stainless steel, you immediately get a hole. So uh, there's a nice thing back in that picture there, though. Let me try and show you that again. Um, What's happening here, you might ask? Well, that's where the beam has been sent off to another user, somebody in another hutch doing spectroscopy, presumably, and these are holes being drilled across this way. And then the, the protein crystals will be in this viscous medium and we'll get brag spots out here, which we record 120 a second. Um, so I mentioned that the amount of protein has gone down dramatically from uh, micro milligrams to about, uh, well, microliters, micrograms. Now, it occurred to us that the nanocrystals in this viscous medium uh, will rotate very slowly. The rotational diffusion time for a one micron crystal in a medium as viscous as LCP is uh, probably, I don't know, milliseconds. And on a modern synchrotron, you can easily get a good exposure in milliseconds, microseconds. So we took some of this stuff to the ESRF last summer and tried out the LCP jet at the ESRF in France and got wonderful results. They're shown here. Our viscous jet works at synchrotrons. Nanocrystal rotation time is long. So this is, what that also means is we can now work in air. So the biologists are thrilled by this. Biologists hate vacuum, right? So we're now working in helium at the LCLS because we have this toothpaste jet to, to use. And here are just diffraction patterns from lysozyme and bacteria rhodopsin recorded at the ESRF using this toothpaste jet, the squirting slowly uh, the material across the beam, which we later index and phase and make a density map. Now that's fine for membrane proteins. Uh, Petra Fromm has a student, Chelsea Conrad, and I gave her the task of trying to find a medium which is equally viscous for soluble proteins so that we can cover everything. And she's done that, and the paper has been submitted to Nature Methods. Um, an important question is the background. Of course, the liquid jet has very little, and this compares the background from the liquid cubic phase jet 
with the new medium that I'm not allowed to tell you about. I'm sworn to secrecy by Petra, and you do not want to cross Petra from. So you get very angry. So uh, this stuff will be named in this paper here, and you see it has less background than the LCP. And we get nice diffraction patterns going out to high resolution. How do we do... Can we, the obvious question then was, can we do time-resolved work in the viscous jet? That would be terrific, because then we don't waste protein again. And we're thinking about how to do that, so here's an idea that might do it. Here are the... That's the illuminated region, the whole green flash there, and these red spots are the X-ray beam. So the idea is that you illuminate a long stretch of the toothpaste and then pick off with X-ray pulses the nanocrystals within that illuminated region, and they will all correspond to different times that they've spent in the jet as it moves along. So we're trying that out, and uh, we got some results. These are preliminary unpublished results. Uh, good crystallographers would not accept the, the quality of this data, but it's sort of beginning to work. This is F0, that means the experimental structure factors for the bright state minus the experimental for the dark state, and forming a difference map here at three sigma level. And this is, what's important about this is our first time resolve work in the viscous jet. So then this was done at the LCLS. This is bacteria rhodopsin at the, in the so-called M1 state. So that's the beginning. And this is a collaboration with Gebhard Schertler at Swissfell and Uwe Weierstahl uh, and Jörg Stanfuss. So this thing is so successful and popular that we're in great, it's become in great demand and we've in fact uh, sent one here to biocars, uh, if anyone is interested in it, let me know. We've now given away 14 of these things, not given away, sold in, very inexpensively, 14 of these to various places, uh, such as Diamond and Martin Vick in France. Uh, Rob Henning, Henning will have one here. Sol Gruner, Chess, Richard Neutzer, um, Moscow, China, Ina Kohn at SSRL, and, uh, and Diamond, of course, and also Daisy. Okay, last topic. Um, Petra from at ASU in our Biodesign Institute uh, has been funded by the university to set up a new institute. A lot of it will be based on an analysis done at the LCLS. And as part of that project, uh, she is funding the construction of an X-ray laser, hopefully, at ASU. Now, to do this, we've hired in my department in physics, Bill Graves. He works with Dave Monkton and MIT, and this is a picture of the planned machine showing its size. It uses the inverse Compton effect, uh, and I've discussed with some of you today the, the promise and problems of these projects. So just let me say that it's in two phases. The phase one is not a lasing machine. It's just a linear X accelerator and inverse Compton X-ray source. And we think that'll give us performance similar to about a, a bending magnet and a synchrotron. Uh, they are hoping, the university is hoping that this will nucleate people to write grants to use it. Bill then wants to make, uh, so that we think we'll be able to build for about three million. And the lab has been designed and they're starting work on that at the moment. Uh, then Bill wants to make a copy of that. And we're, gonna, we're in the process of raising money for that. And the second version is the one which hopefully will someday laze, but that may be some years in the future. Um, so that's that project. Um, if any of you are interested in using the LCLS for this sort of nanocrystallography, for the reasons I stated at the beginning of the talk, your first problem is how to make nanocrystals, right? Um, well, this is all chemistry, it's dreadful. For a physicist, it's just a black art. But the guy who knows all about it is Ed Snell, or one of them. I, I'm aware that you have an excellent facility here for crystal growth and protein expression and so forth. Uh, he's at Halpman Woodward, and he's in this group, and his job is to help you make nanocrystals. So Ed is running a crystal growth workshop em focusing on nanocrystals uh, in, on June the 3rd, which you may want to come to. An indispensable tool in all this is the new sonic instrument, which you probably know about, second-order nonlinear uh, light scattering. You send in green light, and if you get blue light out, it means it's a good protein crystal and not otherwise. It doesn't work for all systems, and there's a long story there. Um, but this is the flow chart of uh, sorting out systematically which crystals are suited to nanocrystal formation and which are not, and how he can help with that. So here's my summary. 
Um, I've told you that the XFEL is preferable, has a, has a niche in protein crystallography in biology for certain applications, one of which is GPCRs, this important class of drugs. I think 60% of modern drugs are based on GPCRs, and some 70% of tri drug trials at the moment are based around GPCRs. So they're an enormously important class of um, drugs for, for which there are important drug targets. Uh, and I showed you an example of that, work by Cherezov, Weistahl, and our collaboration with Ray Stevens. Then I talked about how we can improve the data analysis. Until last year, we were just averaging everything. Now we've started by reducing, because we reduced the amount of protein needed, the time needed to collect data, because of improvements in detector development uh, and other factors, we can, do a, we can consider doing a multi-parameter optimization on every shot. We can spend that much computer time. If you've got 100 terabytes of data, as we had in 2010, the only thing you've got time to do if you want to paper out within a year uh, is average everything. And remember, it takes months to ship round 100 terabytes between several universities. So now we're down to uh, quite modest amounts of data and much smaller amounts of protein. And we can start to analyze the partial reflections and take account of partiality on our stills. Um, I then talked about time-resolved uh, serial femtosecond crystallography and Mari Schmidt's group's work, where he's got this remarkable movie. Now, I, I forgot to say that part of that movie came from here, from biocars. Th th those uh, time steps were not all taken at the LCLS. A, a couple of the longer time steps were taken here at biocars, and he's merged that with the new results from the LCLS, which can take you down to perhaps half a picosecond in time. It's the shortest time frame for, for the movie frame. Uh, I talked about uh, single particle work, the new injector that Rick Curian has made, our resolution limit at 12, 120 angstroms being our best effort on chlorella, and the snapshots of living cells, and work that I think is really exciting, and that's the fast solution scattering, uh, led by Richard Neutzer. And finally, the viscous jets, uh, which are, seem to be in high demand, which allow us to work in helium now uh, using the same medium to deliver the membrane proteins as to grow them. And I'll just end by saying what are our sort of general activities of the STC, of these, you know, about 15 professors around the country with their 180K grants. Every year we have an international conference. I organized the first one in the Royal Society in London, October 13, when, which is when the grant started. The second one was in Puerto Rico, and we're working with the University of Puerto Rico and supporting faculty there. Uh, it was a, a fantastic site for a conference, um, and there's a direct flight from Europe. So we think we'll probably stick with that. Every January, we're going to have a conference, international conference, uh, on this sort of thing. We will run a data analysis, continue that every year. Um, this year, it'll be as part of the ACA conference in Philadelphia this summer. Uh, I've mentioned that these sample delivery gadgets are available if people are interested. I mentioned, uh, I didn't mention LCLS2. Uh, the DOE, in its wisdom, has committed all this money to make a second uh, X ray laser, which will be another beam parallel and next to the existing one. There hang, thereby hangs a long story. ASU has given us money for new labs to keep all the faculty doing this together. And there have been these spin-offs, including the project to build an X-ray laser, small one at ASU, and the crystallization workshops. Thanks very much. Any questions for John? Bob. Thank you for that very exciting talk. I like hearing a nice broad overview of what's going on. One of the big questions I have is some of the samples that have been collected like this and the selected instructions that have involved. Have also been used with LCR cards. There's two major differences. One is room temperature, which as you mentioned yeah. can affect the mosaicity. And the second is the diffraction that we're looking for. And so with the data at LCLS, we've been able to get a few angstroms that were evolution. In some cases, yeah. In some cases, yeah.
to answer that question, you'd have to have identical crystals in both machines. No one can guarantee that. So we, we don't know. I think it depends. Uh, it'll be protein specific, would be my guess. And it depends on these four, four Ds, the diameter of the beam, the De waller factor, the dose. Now, remember the dose without damage can be 100 times higher at the LCLS. So you would expect much stronger high angle scattering. Uh, and the final thing is the nature of the defect. So it depends whether it's long range order or short range order. With the GPCRs, it's suggested that as the crystals grow, uh, the strain accumulates. And if that's true, you'd do worse at a synchrotron. But you have to, it's not as simple as even that because they use these fusion proteins to help with the crystal growth to relieve that strain. Um, so I think there are many factors and the definitive experiment has not been done. What the community will just find out where they're getting better results and, and vote with their feet, I think. They were. They were. In the same batch, right. But, but you see, he wouldn't have used... How did he reduce their size? They would have had to be reduced in size, wouldn't they, for our jet? So they're not the same size as they were here, and there could be strain relief when you reduce their size. But there's a trend. I have seen... I mean, I'm involved in most of these projects. I would say there's a general trend now to get better resolution at the LCLS on a very poor statistical basis of about uh, eight cases. Well, that t chart I put up is helpful. I had 14 structures there. So I have a question for you. So yeah. you didn't talk about the fixed crystal techniques. Do you the think fixed, the, yeah. the fixed crystal techniques? Right. Yeah. Do you think those are really uh, potential? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, one area I haven't time to talk about was 2D crystals. We're working with Matthias Frank and we've got data out to eight angstroms. Now, that's very exciting because you can apply voltages to these iron pump proteins uh, in a 2D array. And so then you have uh, silicon nitride membranes in a huge array, and you pop them off one by one with the beam, 120 a second. Now, you'll, you'll understand that <laughs> it doesn't take much beam time to puncture and destroy uh, you know, a thousand of these crystals, and you've got to make them. <laughs> so you. It's very labor intensive laying out thousands of crystals and you go along for your beam time and it goes bang and, uh, and five minutes later you're, you've, you've destroyed them all. Um, so that, that's that if you're doing diffract and destroy. There are some people doing fixed crystals on a goniometer working below the damage threshold and that's worth looking into. Of course the dose is much lower. Um, Brunger's group in particular is using fixed samples. Now, there's a third possibility with this electrospinning jet, which is like sugar candy, and that can be made, uh, and, and Brunger's group's got good results with that. The work I showed by Helen Jin and uh, Dave Stewart was done that way. It seems to have similar performance to our viscous jet. So for time resolve work on a big single crystal, you have this problem of the optical absorption length matching it to the size of the crystal. Sorry. Usually eight, but it works at 12, but we... Molecular replacement was used in practically every case. Oh, I should have said, very good point. So phasing XFIL data is still a big problem. Uh, everything is, it's, to date, it's usually molecular replacement where you use what's in the protein database as a model, the, the, the protein with the most similar sequence of the 70,000 or so in the database. Now, there have been experiments by Suichi Watsuki, who is doing two-color, where he brings in two pulses of slightly different wavelengths, one above an absorption edge and one below it, and that will be published soon. There's Ilma Schlichting's work, where she just tried conventional SAD, and it worked, but it was gadolinium in lysozyme, which is you know, a model system, very easy. There's, no one's shown that that's a general method. No one's shown that there is a general method. And there's the method I showed with the termination effects on the edge, which may work. If it does, it means you don't, no messy chemicals, you know, no, um, it'd be purely digital method. All right, any other questions? Oh, please. For the pump and approval experiment, yeah. 
it seems that the laser and the X-ray is not overlap. Is that right? Or In the X-ray is not what? The laser and the X-ray is not overlapped. Correct. Is this for some special reason or? Okay. Um, there are two ways to do pump probe. Uh, the Berkeley, our way, uh, we want accurate, if you want accurate timing, you don't want it to, you should not depend on the velocity of the jet. In other words, we illuminate a long stretch of the liquid. And if you illuminate it back inside the capillary tube before the nozzle, the liquid is traveling very slowly. That helps. Now, if you think about a protein which is hit by an X-ray and ask where was it, uh, you say, a microsecond earlier when the laser flash occurred, as long as the protein was within the region illuminated by the laser, you'll have accurate timing and a valid result. So we, uh, actually, I used a cylindrical lens to, to focus the pump laser on a long stretch. And then, and that, that, so the molecules that were in that illuminated region travel in the jet to the point where they're hit by the X-ray laser. But the time must be the time you've set up between, by synchronization between the pump laser and the X-rays. So that method is independent of the velocity of the jet and depends only on the time between the pump laser and the jet. Now, if you want very long times, you should ask the question, what do you do if you want to delay longer than the time between X-ray shots? So then there's a problem. <laughs> then you have to do it the way I showed in a way that does depend on the velocity of the jet. And so there are lots of issues around how it's going to be done in, in, at DESI when the rep rate goes very high. Uh, because there's a thing called shrapnel. You don't want uh, the exploding pieces of one shot to interfere with the next shot. So there are lots of considerations, but th there are solutions to all these problems. A key issue is the time structure of the DESI machine. You see, they want very high rep rate, and so they do on LCLS2, which is a soft X-ray machine. Um, that's fine, but of course, we're limited by the readout rate of the camera. That's all that matters. That's, that sets the, the readout rate. And then the question is, um, can you, well, in, in Germany, it's complicated. The, the time structure is bunches, which are very close together. But lately, they've figured out a way to control the number of micropulses in a bunch, down to one. And, and so their plan was to have these, this bunch of micropulses uh, and read out very rapidly into a cache in the camera, and then in the long, relatively long delay between bunches to read out that cache and start again. That was the plan. I think that's what they're doing. And in that way, you'll be able to read out perhaps 20 kilohertz. Now, this is really important for the single particle project because if you have a superconducting, you can get the high rep rate by using a superconducting LINAC. Uh, if you do that, then you get far more data, 20 kilohertz instead of 100 kilohertz. And that K on root N graph I showed uh, is you're much further along it in a much shorter time. LCLS2, in summary, I think, will give the same data we're getting now more quickly. But you still have the data volume problem. Yes. So that but, but there's that more users. So yeah, that's right. Same data volume, but you've, you've serviced a larger community. Sure. But, uh, of course. All right. Let's thank John again.